Good morning, everybody. So glad to be here with, amongst you all, with you all. I'm looking forward to our partnership with the police officers and the police team over off of Tut. The first night I noticed them here, uh, the students came running out there like, do you know that there's like two police officers out there? And I was like, yeah, I do. And they're like, give me these blank stares waiting for more. And, um, and I was like, and? And they're like, are we, are we in trouble? Are we like, what's going on? I was like, I don't know. What did you guys do? <laughs> and they're like, nothing. And I was like, oh, well, we're fine. They're just hanging out. And they're like, oh, okay, good. And then you'd watch them like every time they'd walk by the door, just keep looking out and like, yeah, they're there. Um, good people, good people that sit in the parking lot. Um, again, like Pastor Tim said, uh, my name is Danny Garrido, youth pastor here at Clay House for about four years, an elder here as well. Um, I'm excited for the opportunity to talk about the triumphal entry, and I want to welcome all of you who are online. I know we have a few family members who are sick, so we're praying for you to con continue to get better. And those who um, are still watching online throughout the pandemic, we can't wait to see everyone again. We miss you and we love you and you're all part of the family in person or virtually. And I just wanted to let everyone know that. Um, before we begin, uh, when Tim asked me to pray, or excuse me, to preach, I got a sense like right away, I, I mean, I'm always uh, eager to jump on the opportunity, but I got a sense of the first thing that came to mind was like, okay, when you get up there, you're going to talk about the Bible. And I was like, well, yeah, Lord, of course I'm going to talk about the Bible. And he's like, no, 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 no. Remember when you went through your ordination and we, you had to talk about the Bible? And I was like, oh, okay. So I was put on my heart to just kind of say, you know, God's word is inerrant. And the inerrancy of God's word means that it is unbreakable. It's consistent all the way through from beginning to end. As Pastor Tim said a couple weeks ago, if the Spirit's talking to you and it conflicts to the Word, then that's not the Spirit, because the Spirit's not going to conflict itself, because the Bible is God's spoken Word through the Spirit, which is inerrant. Scripture cannot be broken, according to James. And God's Word is a lamp unto my feet and to a light unto my path as well. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there, that here at Clayhouse, this is what we believe about God's Word, and it stands true here, and it, as much as it stood true thousands of years ago as well. Today, we're going to talk about the triumphal entry. If you want to thumb where we're going to start, we're going to be in Matthew 21, verses 1 through 17. If you want to just find that place on your device or on your Bibles this morning, and then we're just going to put our thumbs there because I want to give a little bit of an introduction. But this morning, when I was looking for my Bible, I was walking, I walked into my um, my office, and I realized, oh yeah, we've been packing for the last two weeks, and I don't know where my Bibles are at, and I really do like having my, my actual Bible when I'm preaching and not on, on the phone, so I'm reverting to the phone, I'm not texting, or I'm not on the Facebook Live <laughs> responding to comments or anything like that, so I'm reading from my phone just to let everyone, everyone know. Before we talk about today's message about the triumphal entry, the title of today's message is called Simple Obedience, and the kind of the main idea is Simple obedience leads to profound transformation. And I want to give you a story about simple obedience because um, God's simple obedience in our lives actually calls us to have different kinds of sacrifices and to follow his example. So even though it's simple to obey his word and his calling, it requires a lot from us. There was a man at the age of 16 um, who was taken captive. He was taken captive by a couple of raids and taken into another land that wasn't his own. And he lived there for many years as a slave. And it, he got the opportunity to actually escape. I'm giving us here a condensed version of the story, but he got an opportunity to escape. He escaped many, many years later. And then he is back in his homeland free. And while he was in captivity, though, in his writings, you, he, he talks about how he never really liked being part of the church and how he actually, you know, he was a PK and all that jazz, so he was like, had that friction there. But when he was a slave, that's all he clung onto, and the Lord really guided him through that. And so when he came out of captivity, he went into the pastorate. And then at around age 40, God called him and said, hey, I want you to go back to your captors, and I want you to evangelize to them, and I want you to bring them to, to me. 
And I can just imagine how this person's wrestling with that idea because I know I wouldn't want to go back to my captors and for the fear of just getting captured again, even though at this point he's 40 years old. But he ends up going back to the land of where he was captive from, and he goes to the home of his original master and shares the word with him. And this master was a chieftain, and the chieftain takes the gospel, accepts it as his own, and then the rest of the village comes to Christ, comes to faith. And this trend took over um, all throughout of Ireland. Um, And I'm talking about St. Patrick and his story And I'm only bringing it up because it was just a few weeks ago when we were talking, or where we had his celebration. Um, I always think about that story this month because it's just insane how someone would have that kind of simple obedience to go, okay, I'm going to go back to my captors and share the word, and hopefully they don't kill me. (laughs) And I can only feel how Christ felt when he's walking into the Mount of Olives and saying, okay, There's a party next week, but there's a lot of preparation to happen. And as I was sitting reflecting how the Lord would have felt, knowing what's to come as he gets ready for the party on next Sunday that we're going to celebrate, just how how unfathomable it is for us, knowing we're going to walk into our death, knowing that we're going to follow God's obedience And he's going to give his life for us. So that's a story of simple obedience and how profoundly that changed the world in Ireland. And how now he's, um, you know, he's not an official saint according to the Catholic Church. But following God's call doesn't need to be sainthood or anything like that because we're all saints in his eyes. Amen? So chapter 21 of Matthew, verse 1 through 17. Let's read it together. The triumphal entry. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them one. He will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to daughter Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast of of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey to and the colt and put them on their, excuse me, they brought the donkey and the colt, and put them on their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and the others cut the branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before them had said, following them, saying, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he had done, the chil- and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they, did, and they said to him, Do you hear what they are saying? And he said, Yes. Have you not read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. Wow. I just can't imagine going into the temple, going against the grain, and just throwing all that up, and yelling at people, and and going up to the leaders, and just sticking it right into their face, um, the hypocrisy that they were living in. Now, before we get started, um, I just wanted to define one term, is because it all centers around obedience. 
As I was thinking about obedience, in my culture and in my context, obedience meant you do as you're told, you don't question it, and that's, that's it. There is no, there's nothing else inside of that or after that. My dad was raised in a military context, so he thought we were like his little soldiers growing up. And so it was always like, yes, dad, yes, sir, yes, dad, yes, sir, yes, mom. And then that, there was no questioning any of that. Um, and so for a long time, obedience always meant you do as you were told. And to an extent, in our culture, that's still kind of the same. I, I know a lot of us who have children or those who are in leadership positions at work, you know, there's directives and we all follow and we kind of do as we are told. In the Hebrew culture, the word obedience, there, isn't, there wasn't really one, as I was searching, there isn't really one specific word that leads to do as you're told. Because in the Hebrew culture, there is just layer upon layer of language and meaning, and it all ties into each other so that um, you have a more profound sense of what is going on in your day-to-day -day context. Um, so instead of me trying to explain this small word to you, I have a video that we're gonna sh I'm going to show you, and the video comes from the Bible Project, and they really help pull apart all these different layers of meaning into what it really means to obey in a Hebrew culture, and how we can reflect on that and follow Christ in our simple obedience towards him. For thousands of years, every morning and evening, Jewish people have prayed these well-known words as a way of expressing their devotion to God. They're called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And as for you, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Now, the first word of the Shema is hear or listen, which in Hebrew is pronounced Shema. That's where the prayer gets its name. Now, Shema is a really common word in the Hebrew Bible, and it's obvious why. Hearing is a very universal activity. It's usually connected with the ear, as in Proverbs chapter 20, ears that Shema and eyes that see, the Lord has made them both. Now that seems basic enough, but if you look at the other ways that Hebrew authors can use the word Shema, they use it to mean more than just let sound waves enter your ear. In Hebrew, Shema can also mean pay attention to or focus on. So when Leah, who wasn't loved by her husband Jacob, she has a son and she names him Simon, or in Hebrew, Shimon, because she says, the Lord has Shamad, that I am unloved. So Shema means to hear and to pay attention to and even more. It can also mean responding to what you hear. This is why so many of the cries for help in the book of Psalms begin with a call that God listen. Psalm 27 verse 7, Shema my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful, answer me. So asking God to Shema is at the same time asking God to act, to do something. It's similar to when God asks people to listen. Like when the people of Israel come to Mount Sinai, God says, if you shema me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Now there's a couple interesting things about this verse in Exodus. In Hebrew, the word shema is repeated twice in this sentence to give it emphasis. If you shema shema, meaning listen closely. But also notice that from God's point of view, listening is basically the same as keeping the covenant. So when God asks the people to Shema, what he means is that they listen and obey. And that's the last fascinating thing about Shema. In ancient Hebrew, there is no separate word for obey, meaning to carry out the wishes of someone who knows better than you or is in authority over you. So in the Bible, if you want to say, I will listen and do what you say, you use the single word Shema. In Hebrew, listening and doing are two sides of the same coin. This is why later in Israel's history, when the people were breaking their covenant promises to God, the Hebrew prophets would say things like, they have ears, but they're not listening. The Israelites, of course, could hear just fine, but they weren't actually listening or else they would act differently. And so in the end, listening in the Bible is about giving respect to the one speaking to you and doing what they say. Real listening takes effort and action, and that's the Hebrew word Shema. Wow. It's good every time. I don't know if you get a kick out of it as much as I do, but I really enjoy watching these videos. Um, so the different layers of meanings and how we should respond to the Lord when he asks us to obey to him. So we're not just obeying out of a directive. We're listening, hearing, paying attention, focusing, 
and all of that is culminating into one movement towards him. Now, if you look to your Bibles, we're going to look at verses 7 through 11, and I'll read it for us here. 7 through 11 states that they brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd there spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut the branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And he entered Jerusalem, and the whole city was stirring up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. It's interesting that in this first section of talking about simple obedience, we're going to be looking at Christ's simple obedience and how he enters Jerusalem. And before he enters Jerusalem, he's in Beth Bethpage at the Mount of Olives. And if the little bit of topography here, when you're in the Mount of Olives, you're kind of higher up and Israel's kind of a little bit lower and the entry was from top to bottom. And as I was reflecting on this a little bit, it made me think of, Genesis 1, how the garden's just ripped up out of the ground and, and this beautiful place is made in the high places and it's a place where the, God has intended that the rest of the world should have communion with him and blessings will come to the rest of the world out of this wonderful garden and there's a person in there who has to make a choice and to obey what God has to say and unfortunately that obedience was negated as we all know and here we have God fulfilling his own prophecy to Moses, saying, I'm in the Mount of Olives, I'm in this garden, I'm going to enter into the promised people, and I'm going to bring the word and salvation to them, as you have instructed me to do. But when we see here, in that time, the Roman oppression was strong, and people were very much interested in seeing that Jesus the Messiah was actually going to be Jesus the Messiah, a political savior, not Jesus the Messiah, the creator and savior of the world. So when Christ was entering, everyone was kind of buzzing about thinking, is this the one? And he's the one who's going to free us from the Romans. And Christ gives us a good juxtaposition and fulfills prophecy here. Instead of coming in on a horse, because coming in on a horse would mean I'm coming in as a conqueror over you. Um, that, would, that was a cultural significance back then, that he would enter in the city on a horse. That means he was coming in to conquer Rome, challenge Herod, challenge Caesar. He was there to aggravate and aggress and lift up a political movement, and he was showing that he would be superior to those in the land. But God, in all of his wisdom, gives us such this upside-down kingdom where the first is last and the last is first. He sits on a donkey, which would symbolize submissiveness, meekness, and humbleness to not only the Romans, but to the Israelites. And as I was reading about this just a little bit more, I came across a little excerpt from Fulton Sheen. Um, he's a Catholic priest who gave this excerpt that I just really enjoyed reading, and I thought you guys might as well also. If not, you can tell me later if you didn't like it. But here it goes, and it'll be on the screen uh, for those here and for those online. He says about this entry on a donkey, the prophecy came from God through a prophet, and now God himself was bringing it to fulfillment. The prophecy of Zacharias was meant to contrast the majesty and humility of the Savior. As one looks at ancient sculptured slabs of Assyria and Babylon and murals of Egypt, the tombs of Persians, and the scrolls of the Roman columns, one is struck by the majesty of the kings riding in triumph on horses or in chariots and sometimes over the prostrate bodies of their foes. In contrast to this, here is one who comes triumphant upon an ass. Excuse me. How Pilate, if he was looking out of his fortress that Sunday, must have been amused by the ridiculous spectacle of a man being proclaimed as king and yet seated on a beast that symbolizes the outcast, a fitting vehicle for one riding into the jaws of death. 
If he had entered into the city on a regal pomp in the matter of conquerors, he would have given occasion to believe that he was a political messiah. But the circumstances he chose validated his claim that his kingdom was not from this world. There is no suggestion that this proper king was a rival to Caesar. Isn't that just wonderful? Just the, that juxtaposition of the two, king versus king, one earthly king, one heavenly king, and how he rides on this beast who's meant to be for the outcasts. Just how fitting and how obedient God was, or Jesus is, to his father God. I mean, I remember growing up, there was times where my dad would ask me to do things that I felt were embarrassing, and that was going to the counter of a store and like paying for something on my own with the money that he would give me. I would find that very embarrassing. But I had never had an opportunity where, or an experience where my dad asked me to go do something that would put me in a position to be made looked at like a fool in front of others. Um, but here, Christ is asked to get on a cult to fulfill prophecy on a beast who is meant for outcasts. I just find that very profound. And how obedient he was and the example that he gives. So moving on, that's one set of his obedience that we can follow. I'm going to skip down to verses 12 through 17, and I'll have them here on the screen as well, just as we're looking at his obedience. When he enters now the temple, for the first time entering upon Israel, and he entered the temple and he drove out all those who were selling and who bought the temp and who were selling and buying within the temple, and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. For it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw this wonderful thing, he did the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna! To the Son of God, to the Son of David, they were indignant, and they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And yes, Jesus said, Yes, you have, have you not read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared a praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city into Beth Bethany and lodged there. When just, what's interesting here is that what we haven't read quite yet is that when, God, when Christ is entering the city, um, he starts crying, actually. He starts crying because he knows what's going to happen in about 40 years' time. The city's just going to get demolished by the Romans and, and torn down. But he goes into the city anyways upon obedience, and he's challenging the, the, the way of the culture, the way of the law at the time, and he's turning over these, the money tamers and the money changers, and I can just imagine like money being everywhere, pigeons are flying out of their cages, and in one a gospel, he's talking about how he creates a whip and he's whipping them out. Um, could you just imagine someone coming into our church and like doing that and like whipping Pastor Tim and I out? <laughs> like, I think, I think we would more be in lean be like, hey, leave Pastor Tim alone. <laughs> but... He's going against the grain. He's going against the current culture. And I've always like, thought, and I've tried to research on it, like where this idea came of how did it come about where it was a good idea that they decided to start selling money, I mean selling pigeons and selling offerings in the temple. I didn't quite find a direct answer, but I can only imagine as I was sitting there contemplating how it must have thought like a great idea at the time. Like, think about it, you know, okay, I'm a Pharisee, and there's another Pharisee, and they're just, we're just talking like, hey, man, think about it. Instead of having people bringing stuff in all the time, why don't we just provide this service to our people, and then they can, they can buy them right then there on the spot. That's like us helping them out. Oh, yeah, that's such a good idea. Aren't we just great? Thank the Lord, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and it's all built out of these good intentions, and then, but when money gets thrown into the mix, 
there's an opportunity to control, there's an opportunity for greed to set in, and there's an opportunity to start secluding those who didn't have enough to buy for their offerings and, and pushing them out of the temple versus allowing the temple to be a house of prayer and allowing the temple to be a place where everyone can come. Because when we're, city, when we're seated with the Lord and we're in his presence and when we're all together as a family, it doesn't matter what the cultural status is that we have. We're all equal, and the Lord makes us that way. We're all equal in his eyes. But here we see that it's got corrupted somehow, and the wisdom of man took over once again, taking it upon himself to do things for the Lord versus obeying what God had already directed. And when Christ comes in, he's quoting from Jeremiah, telling them that they have made it a house of robbers and a den of thieves, and he wants it to be a house of prayer, because when we pray with the Lord and when we pray with each other, when we come together in those moments, we're cultivating a sense of trust, a sense of generosity to one another, to the Lord, trust amongst each other and trust with the Lord. And we're also opening the door to an inclusion of everybody and not an exclusion of those who are left without. So this, was, this first example was following what Christ had in his triumphal entry as he obeyed the Lord's directive to go into Israel and start preparing the way for Friday. Now, I'm going to switch back. We're going to go back to the very first verse. We're going to read verses 1 through 7, and we're going to look at the obedience of other characters within this triumphal narrative. We're going to look at the obedience of the disciples, and we're going to look at the obedience of the cult owner. Let me scroll back up. All right. Verses 1 through 7. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Beth, Beth, excuse me, Bethage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied, and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything, you, if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying to Zion, the daughter, <clears throat> excuse me, saying, say to Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the fowl of a beast. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Forgive me, I hate reading from my, from my phone, um, so I always get mixed up. That's why I was bummed I couldn't find my Bible this morning, because it's in a box somewhere. Anyhow, God, excuse me, Jesus is asking for two disciples to be obedient to him as he's asking them to go into the city village in front of them, which is Bethany, and to go and take a colt and his mother. Now, in that time, if you, had an, if you had an opportunity to have animals, let alone two, you're well off. You're well off because you're able to feed not only your family, and your kids' families, but you're also able to feed all these animals. So when Christ, when I was reading this, I was like, Christ is asking them to go take someone's property. And they're like, yeah, sure, let's go do it. I mean, could you imagine if, if, if I had asked you to go take property from someone, and nowadays you'd be like, hold up, you're telling me to go take someone's property? But they just willingly did it. They willingly went down there to go take someone's property. And I just find this very interesting because I don't know what they were saying on their way down to Bethany. You know, I can only imagine, like, hey, what are we actually going to do when someone does come out and say, why are you taking these donkeys? I don't know, man, but I'm kind of scared. I might run. I mean, that's what I would have said, right? But We've already seen so many miracles on their way here, so this has to be true. So if the Lord wants us to do this, we need to do this. And they did, and they went down there, and they took. And I can only imagine being in the kitchen watching these two men come down and take my donkeys. 
you know, and wouldn't you be upset? That's like someone coming off onto your lawn and like stealing like your lawn, like during Christmas. Um, I used to do some tomfooleries when I was very young, and I would go around my neighborhood and like mess with people's ornaments or take their little gnomes and put them somewhere else or put them on someone else's yard. Um, my neighbors did not find that funny at all. Um, it's funny to laugh about it now, uh, almost 20 years later, but it, but it wasn't funny at the time. And I got in trouble once uh, by a neighbor, and they called the police. And actually, my parents don't even know the story. My mom's sitting right there. It's her first time hearing this one. <laughs> but they called the police, and the police came out, and they were asking me questions, and I was denying it up and down, up and down. And they were like, okay. And I think I was 13. And then he said, okay, we know it's you because you fit the description, and you also have, like, this bright yellow jacket on. And they saw you. And so, so just come clean with it. Luckily, nothing happened. Um, as far as like with the police, but me going on to someone else's land and taking something that they purchased to put on display, you know, I was taking Rudolph or the nativity scene and just messing with everything because I thought it was funny. Um, and then you have this owner who owns two donkeys, his property, his livelihood, the donkeys are definitely there to help work, and you see these two dudes come up and try to take them. And I couldn't imagine being running out the door and saying, excuse me, what do you think you are doing? You know, I'm sure that the Centurion Patrol is right around the corner, and they say just one sentence, the Lord needs them. And he's like, okay, the Lord needs them, okay. Like, what great obedience in that, in that moment, right? How many times has the Lord asked me to do something where I've been like, oh, that seems simple enough, but I'm not going to do it? It's happened to me a lot. Um, I, I grew up in a rough state because I chose not to obey. If I would have just obeyed a lot of the heartaches that I caused my family and a lot of the heartache that I put myself through would have never been um, happening or never happened, actually. But the Lord always has a plan, and he has a plan to fulfill and bring things into redemption. But this owner says, okay, you can have these donkeys. And there's also church uh, history behind this and church theory that this house is actually the house of John Mark, who accompanies uh, Paul and Barnabas, who is also accredited to um, writing the Gospel of Mark. And this is the house that they have the Last Supper in. Um, and so how it all comes together, as you continue reading the story throughout the week, the obedience that happens by just saying, yes, you can take my donkeys, and then your son be becomes one of the greatest heralds of the Lord by writing his gospel, and you get to provide the Last Supper in your own home. Um, just how profoundly things can happen by just obeying when the Lord says, the Lord needs them. And I ask you guys, what is God asking you in your heart? I need this of you. And can we follow this example of these two disciples who are asked to take property or who are asked to release property as the cult owner? So small obedience leads into profound transformation. Now, moving forward, this is the last point, and it all points back to us. Jesus is asking us for obedience as we take example of his triumphal entry, entering Jerusalem as an outcast, even though he's being praised as the Savior, as the one who is going to save. Unfortunately, man in all its wisdom always comes up short because they thought they were going to be released of their Roman oppression and the political powers of the day would be no more. But Christ had something completely different. So Jesus calls you to himself, and have you accepted his kingship? It took me a long time to realize that I was a follower of Christ, but... I didn't accept God's kingship over my life, which meant that I kept God kind of at a arm's length away. 
Anytime I needed the Lord, I could just reach in and say, hey, how's it going? Good to see you. You remember me? Can you help me with this situation? Instead of laying down my cloak and praising him always as my king, ready to serve, ready to obey, and not, I used to call it, not be my quarter God, where I could just throw a quarter in the machine and he'd pop out an answer for me, or he'd help me get out of a specific situation. And so I'm asking you guys the same thing. Has, have you accepted his kingship? Obedience calls for sacrifice. As the Lord is heading into um, this week, he knows that on Friday, the same people are going to be yelling, crucify him. How interesting. As I reflect on that and think through how many times have I been in that same boat where like, yeah, I'm all about the Lord, and then like a couple days later, I'm yelling, crucify him. By my actions, by my unobedience, by my unwilling to follow his word, by my stubborn heart. His sacrifice upon that cross that we'll get to celebrate on Friday makes it all worth it. And when we accept the Lord as our King and Savior, our worth is tied up all in that sacrifice. Our worth is made up all in through there because it's all been paid for and laid down on the cross. So when God asks you to sacrifice something, turn to the cross and know that it's all been paid for, that your worth and your value is all on that cross, and he loves you for who you are, and it doesn't matter what excuse you can come out of. He just wants you to simply obey what he has for you. Now, I always had an issue with this simple obedience because in my mind, I make these plans of like, how I'm going to make my year better by reading all these books and devising a plan to grow in knowledge um, with the you know church history or in my own personal like trying to find books of adventure and fantasy and just you, you know bringing it all together so that I can just read better and know more out of reading and then I don't do it because because I've created this big game where I just need to actually be simply obedient to the Lord and say, okay, Lord, today's the day where I'm going to read one verse. Next week, I'm going to read two verses. The following week, three, and then you're turning it into and you're snowballing it. So don't get caught up like I get caught up every now and then by making these grandiose plans to obey and how it's going to look like when you obey, but take that first step, that leap into the faith of what God has for you. So to restate everything, Christ's obedience into Jerusalem, the disciples' obedience to take the cult, the cult's owner's obedience to release the cult, all reflects into our own story in the Lord, how we obey with him. I encourage you guys this week just to read the week of Christ's life leading into Friday and how we can obey his calling in our life in the smallest ways to turn those small ways into profound meaning that can multiply and extend through the generations. And you can pass that off to your neighbors, to your children, to their children, to their neighbors. And next thing you know, you're multiplying and you're snowballing. Kind of like St. Patrick in the beginning. He went to his one chieftain that enslaved him and he brought him to the Lord. And then it snowballed and now all of Ireland at that time knew the Lord. How great is that? And God has that for you too in the smallest and simplest ways. I'm going to pray for us. Lord, we thank you for all that you are and who you have made us to be in you. We thank you for your cross. We thank you for the example that you've given us and how you forgive us every time we have those stubborn hearts and those stubborn thoughts. Lord, move in us this week 
to draw us closer to you, to simply obey in the smallest ways that lead to profound transformation in you so that we can be a part of your calling to bring heaven on earth. 